So, trick question for Brady. Where does the sun rise? The sun rises in the east. Yes. Yeah. So that's the basic answer. Sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And it does that because we on Earth are, the, the Earth is rotating in that direction, which makes the apparent motion of the sun seem to track across the sky. But exactly where in the east the sun rises uh, depends very much on the time of year and your latitude. So I've set this software up so that we are in Nottingham. So hopefully you can see the date down here, which is set to the 21st of June, 2011. The time is 3.42 in the morning, which is why it's dark. And we're looking due east. So we expect the sun to rise somewhere in this vicinity. And we're gonna track through, the sun's getting, the sky's getting lighter, and bang. There, there the sun appears above the horizon. But it's not appearing due east, not at all. It's uh, appearing quite a long way north of east. And that's, that's the furthest north that the sun is going to get this year. And to explain what's happening, I can actually put up a grid. And this is the projection of our longitude and latitude on the Earth projected out onto the celestial sphere. If you look up, 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 you can see the, the projection of the North Pole. You can see that the path the sun takes along the sky certainly isn't in a straight up and down direction. It's following this very long curved arc. Because it starts so far north here, on the longest day, it has this huge long arc that travels across the sky. What I can actually do here, though, is advance uh, through the year. I'll go week by week now, and we're gonna stay at the same time every day. So we're around about 9.30, and you'll notice the sun is dramatically changing its position. And in fact, if we get all the way down to December, December 21st, we get the opposite effect. We get the winter solstice, where the sun rises in, at its southern, most southerly position. So if I swing round, now we're looking due south. And again, if I fast forward through one day, you'll see here, the sun just barely arcs above the horizon. And that's why at northerly latitudes, as we are in, in Nottingham, we're at a latitude of 52 degrees, the winter days are very short. This is happening for the same reason we have the seasons. Uh, it's happening because the Earth's axis is tilted towards and away from the sun by an angle of 23 and a half degrees. So if the, sun, if the Earth's axis wasn't tilted, we wouldn't have seasons at all. Every day would be the same as the last. But because of this tilt in the, in the Earth's axis, some parts of the Earth at different times of year are bathed in more sunlight than other parts of the Earth. I guess the, the important thing from a modern astronomer's point of view is that the, the solstice is the time of year when the nights are shortest, which means that your working night is the shortest. Um, so actually some of us quite look forward to the, the summer solstice because it means that when we do go observing it means we only have to observe for five or six hours rather than the 12 or 13 hours you get if you're observing in the middle of winter. Surely you want the 13 hours though. 13 hours is a very long time to be running a telescope for, so no, actually I quite enjoy the short summer nights. And also, of course, the other benefit is summer nights are much more likely to be clear. So not only do you have a short working night, but actually you're actually more likely to get something productive out of it as well. So let's take another look at the sun's path through the sky throughout the year. You could make this same effect by going outside your house and taking a picture of the rising sun or the sun at any time of day, as long as it was the same time of day every year. And as we fast forward through first one year, and now another year, week by week, you see this very distinctive pattern building up, this figure of eight. And this is called an analemna. This is the, the path that the sun takes throughout the year. And if we look at the top of the analemna, and now I'll advance day by day, you see that the position of the sun, the sun's motion seems to slow down and almost stop. The point at which it stops is the solstice. So the word solstice comes from the Latin sol, which is sun, and sistera, which is to stand still. So the sun obviously isn't actually standing still, but as we look at it day by day, its transition in a northerly and southerly direction seems to pause, turn around, and head in the other direction. At each end is the solstice, and at the middle, it happens twice a year, um, September 21st and March 21st is the equinox. That's the other important point in the annual calendar with respect to the sun's motion through the Earth. So at the equinox, if we reverse back to sunrise on this day, September 21st, we'll find that, boom, the sun now rises due east.
So on two days of the year, no matter where you are on Earth, the sun will rise exactly due east and set exactly due west. I guess it's, it's sort of buried deep in people's consciousness because back in the days when you know, we were agricultural societies and understanding what the seasons were doing was sort of vitally important to us, um, then clearly it was a big deal because you needed to know where you were in that cycle to know what to do with your crops and so on. So I guess at some very sort of deep level it's embedded in this, the importance of these things. And clearly, you know, Christmas, for example, you know, probably the biggest ceremony of the year, is fundamentally about the solstice. You know, it's, it's sort of been adopted by the Christian church, but they really just borrowed the winter solstice um, for, the, for the celebration. So it clearly is, even, even today, it's sort of deeply embedded in our culture. The behaviour of the sun that we see depends very much on where we are on Earth. So we can, for example, take a trip with this software up to the North Pole. So of course, at the summer solstice on the North Pole, the North Pole is, head, is tilted directly towards the sun. It's going to be bathed in perpetual sunlight all day. There's going to be no sunrise and no sunset. So what do you think happens to the sun? Now at the North Pole at the 21st of June, if we fast forward through a day now, the sun will just appear to rotate around the horizon at the same altitude. No sunrise, no sunset. Whereas if we visit the equinox here, so back at September 21st, the sun's just going to cruise right around the horizon for the entire day. That's the last you're going to see of the sun for six months because the next day it's going to dip down below the horizon and it's going to stay there until the next equinox where it reappears and moves its way above the horizon. If we look at a globe, old-fashioned globes, you may have noticed a couple of, dot of of lines marked on there. One is the Tropic of Cancer in the north, and one is the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. And that's the latitude at which the sun is directly overhead on the summer solstice. So here in Nottingham, the sun actually never gets directly overhead. Um, it's always sort of tilted with respect to the horizon. But between these two lines of latitude, some, at some point during the year, the sun will be directly overhead. Now that's an interesting little factoid, but 2,000 years ago it led to a Greek astronomer calculating very simply the circumference of the Earth. So the reason he was able to do this was that he discovered, this was Eratosthenes, and he uh, was in ancient Egypt, and he discovered in a manuscript a description of a town called Siren, I think, which was located on the Tropic of Cancer. And there was a special feature about this town that was, that was noted down. On the summer solstice, the sun would shine directly down a, a particular well there and not cast a shadow. And he was a very clever man and he realized that this wasn't the same behavior that was exhibited it, at Alexandria, where he was some distance to the north. On the summer, uh, the summer solstice, a stick or a well in the ground would actually cast a shadow. So he made a measurement on the summer solstice of this shadow located in, in Alexandria and came up with uh, a measurement of seven and a half degrees. And he, he figured, he thought, like many ancient Greeks, that the Earth was round. And he thought, okay, seven and a half degrees is approximately one fiftieth of 360 degrees, a full circle. Therefore, the distance between Alexandria and Siren must be one fiftieth of the circumference of the Earth. According to the story, he then paid someone to march out and measure the distance between those two cities, two towns, and he actually came up with a calculation of the circumference of the Earth that was good to within about 4%, which was pretty impressive, all from measuring a few angles and a, and a distance and knowing a bit about how the sun moved around the sky. And he didn't have one of those things to do it, did he? And he did not have one of these things to do it, no. So interestingly, the Tropic of Cancer uh, was so named because several thousand years ago when, when they named it, the sun was actually in the constellation of Cancer. That's no longer the case now. Because the Earth's axis processes, uh, it sort of wobbles like a spinning top, um, on the summer solstice, the sun is actually in the constellation of Taurus. Well, all of this is happening because if you are the sun, Brady, the Earth is tilted at 23 degrees towards you. And so it's rotating, which is causing a day, but it's also moving around you, which is causing the year. So at the summer solstice, uh, in the northern hemisphere, um, 
the, the North Pole is pointing towards the sun. At the, what we call the winter solstice, but of course you would probably call the summer solstice, being from the southern hemisphere, the South Pole is tilted towards the sun, and the sun and the Earth is still rotating like this. Well, we're reasonably close to upright, and in fact most of the planets are sort of reasonably close to upright, which presumably does indeed reflect the fact that the solar system did all form from this single spinning disk, and the planets sort of remember about that spin, and so spin more or less the same way. But of course various things have gone on since the planets formed. Um, so for example, it's thought that the way the moon was formed was by something fairly large smashing into the Earth and knocking a chunk of the Earth out. And obviously the direction in which that impact occurred could well have tipped the axis one way or the other. So although the planets sort of remember how the solar system formed in that their axes tend to be pointed more or less the same, they tend to have the same kind of spin as the solar system, they all have had sort of subsequent history which has knocked them about a bit. So for thousands of years, not to go over the top, but astronomy was one of the first and most fundamental sciences. Imagine the power that astronomers had being able to predict uh, the, the times of the seasons, when the sun would rise, um, solar eclipses, that sort of thing. And you can see this in civilizations around the world, people building gigantic monuments or kinds of observatories that would actually track and help calculate these things. So case in point, of course, one very famous one in the UK is Stonehenge. And Stonehenge is very famous at the summer solstice because the people who built it knew exactly where on the horizon on that particular day the sun was going to rise. And so they built it so that if you're standing in the center looking out the entrance, you'll see the sun rising at a particular point.